Hi, it's Bruce Williams again, and I've heard such good things about how people enjoyed our first gross path challenge. I thought I would give you another one with an added twist because today we are going all the way back to 1993. The descriptive course in 93 was the first descriptive course that I ever taught along with the staff of the AFIP and Paul Stromberg. The images were projected Kodachromes, which have been scanned and making available to you today. You note that this will add an additional level of difficulty because some are a little out of focus and the colors aren't quite as crisp as what we get on today's digital cameras because so many of these have been duplicated many times and shipped all across the country and this is how we all learned pathology back in the 1980s and 90s. Don't let these old images fool you because a classic lesion is still a classic lesion. So get out your piece of paper and a pencil and we'll compare answers after each slide. The first slide is tissue from an aborted bovine fetus. And I would like for you to give me a morphologic diagnosis and an etiologic diagnosis. Did you take about a minute to write down your answers? Okay. The morphologic diagnosis generally includes the distribution, the process, and the organ. The organ here is skin, the distribution is multifocal, and the process is proliferative or hyperkeratotic or both. The best morphologic diagnosis is, morpho is multifocal, proliferative, and hyperkeratotic dermatitis. The etiologic diagnosis is usually a two-word diagnosis, which is composed only of the organ and the etiology. In this case, the etiologic diagnosis is mycotic dermatitis. If I asked you for the cause, Aspergillus fumigatus would be fine, or any other fungus in the order Mucorales. This is a lesion that is seen with fungal abortion and neonatal death in cattle. And it is the result of contamination of the mother's feed during winter months. And hematogen is spread from the rumen or the respiratory tract to the placenta. Ultimately, it gets through the placenta into the fetus. It circulates in the amniotic fluid and will attach to the skin of the dorsal surface of the neonate and form these plaques. Because the neonate is also inhaling this fluid, you can also find it in the respiratory tract where it may cause a bronchopneumonia. And also, the contents of the stomach are an excellent place to culture in the fetus because they swallow the amniotic fluid as well. Okay, let's go on to number two. This is tissue from a chicken. I would like a morphologic diagnosis. Okay, that's long enough. Hopefully it was a minute for you. The morphologic diagnosis for this lesion, we're looking at the kidneys of a chicken. Did you know that chickens have six kidneys? These are actually semi-independent kidneys. And you can see the white speckles on top of the kidneys. This is diffuse renal gout. If you call this diffuse urate nephrosis, that would be fine. Renal gout is generally the result of dehydration in poultry because they excrete uric acid. And when they get, get dehydrated, it tends to build up in the blood. You can see it precipitate out throughout the viscera and especially in the kidneys. And the precipitation of urates in the kidneys results in granulomatous inflammation. If you said that this was a multifocal or a diffuse granulomatous nephritis with 
Gaudi Tophi, you are 100% correct as well. Even the best flocks have a low but constant incidence of gout because older or weakened animals are unable to get to the water to compete for the water in these houses and will dehydrate on the sides. So you pretty much always see a very low background, maybe one to two percent of gout in chickens at necropsy. Let's move on to number three. This is tissue from a squirrel monkey. I would like you to give me one of those good two-word etiologic diagnoses and the cause. Well, this is an oldie but a goodie. And it's sort of difficult to get oriented on. But if you take a close look, we're in a tubular organ which looks like gut. There are several white tubular parasites located in the same region. And then you have this little tube going off to the side, which is a blind-ended pouch. And this is the cecum. It's very difficult to cut the ileocecal junction without getting a T-shape. And so small intestine, cecum, and large intestine right here. And a parasite of New World monkeys that loves to live at the ileocecal valve is Prostenorchus elegans. Prostenorchus elegans lives right here. A related parasite, Prostenorchus spirula, lives in the terminal ileum. And the intermediate hosts for these are beetles, especially cockroaches, so you can see them in zoo animals. They usually don't do too much trouble, but occasionally they may penetrate too deep and perforate the colon. The etiologic diagnosis that I asked for, once again, it's two words, the agent and the organ is intestinal, acanthocephalidiasis. Other acanthocephalids that you should know is Macrocanthorhynchus arudinaceus, which lives in pigs. Let's try another one. This is tissue from a cat. I would just like a morphologic diagnosis. So, I didn't ask you for a cause because I'm not exactly sure what it is. But let's talk about why splenic infarcts happen. They happen because the blood supply in the spleen is terrible. Blood sort of percolates through the red pulp. All of the arteries of the spleen are end arteries. It was made to infarct itself. And the spleen's a physiologic organ, and we're often adding additional cells. We may add them in times of sepsis. We may add them in times where we need to produce additional red blood cells and white blood cells. The normal reticuloendothelial pool is constantly in flux, and if we add too many cells, it further impinges on the tenuous blood supply. If you think about the dog, hemorrhages and areas of infarction often pop up around tumors or nodules of hyperplasia, where the concentration of cells is markedly increased locally. So this is why we have infarcts in a cat maybe because this animal is septic or bacteremic, had a uh, fungal infection, can't tell you. But you should recognize the underlying pathogenesis of splenic infarcts and go from there. Slide number five is tissue from an ox. I would like an etiologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay, the etiologic diagnosis is skeletal muscle cystocerciasis. Skeletal muscle being the organ, cystocercus being the agent, and the cause is cystocercus bovis, which is the larval form of the adult human tapeworm, tinea saginata. In the bovine, 
the immature forms will break out of the intestine, migrate through the tissues of the body, looking for the heart and the skeletal muscles, especially the more metabolically active skeletal muscles like those of the jaw, which are almost in constant motion in adult cattle. And they set up shop there, they insist, and then they wait to complete their life cycle when the animal is slaughtered, the muscle meat is eaten by humans, and the tapeworm continues. This used to be known as measly beef. Slide number six is obviously from a pig. I would like a morphologic diagnosis and two possible causes. Okay, the morphologic diagnosis I came up was diffuse, pinnal, congestion, and thrombosis. And I'm going to give you a list of possible causes for this particular lesion that hopefully you are able to come up with two of. When I look at this lesion, it makes me think of an organism which causes thrombosis either by affecting the endothelium directly, such as two viruses in swine. One is porcine pestivirus, the causative agent of classical swine fever, which is endotheliotropic in nature, and you'll see hemorrhages throughout the, bottom, the body. And the other one that I always have trouble with, and I usually just lump them together, is the agent of African swine fever virus of the genus Aspar virus. While this particular virus doesn't affect the endothelium directly, it does cause upregulation of a number of cytokines produced from macrophages throughout the body, which end up causing vasculitis. The other time that you'll see this particular lesion affecting the extremities of the pig, which would also include the feet and the snout, would be in cases of systemic sepsis, organisms that go throughout the body causing damage to endothelium or thrombosis. A prototypical cause of this would be Salmonella cholera suis or Salmonella typhi suis, host adapted salmonella, which generally result in septicemia in the early stages and only the fibrinonecrotic enteritis we usually associate with salmonellosis in the late stages of this disease. I would also probably throw actinobacillus suis into that list of agents that cause endotoxic damage throughout the body. One more that is well known for causing thrombosis in multiple organs in affected pigs would be erysipelothrix ruseopathy. Slide seven is from a dog. Can you give me a good morphologic diagnosis? Take just a minute and think about it. Okay, a minute is up. Now I would take one of two possibilities for this lesion. Without histology, I can't tell. We are looking at the base of the skull and a large cyst which replaces a lot, if not all, of the pituitary gland. Now this may be a simple cyst of the distal cranial pharyngeal duct. And if you wrote down pituitary cyst, that's fine. Cysts of the cranial pharyngeal duct are extremely common, seen in up to 50% of dogs and don't really cause any problem. If you cut through the pituitary, you'll often see small parts of these cysts. The pituitary, for the most part, looks and acts totally normal. However, if you're dealing with a very small-looking German Shepherd dog who has not gotten his adult dentition in, the physes are still open uh, shortly before a year of age, he has a poor hair coat, and he's 
undersized, you are likely dealing with a different condition altogether, which is associated with a failure of differentiation of the oropharyngeal ectoderm of Rathke's pouch, which gives rise to the pars distalis. And animals with these cysts have no pars distalis in their pituitary gland. We tend to think of them as runts with a number of problems due to a lack of somatostatin. But remember that without the chemicals that are produced, the hormones from the pars distalis, you will have no development of the thyroid gland, you will have no development of the adrenal cortex. These animals will have atrophic adrenal glands and be prone to Addisonian crises. This occurs as an autosomal recessive change in German Shepherd dogs. We have three slides left. Would you like to continue? Last one was a little tricky. Hopefully you'll have better luck with this one. This is tissue from an ox. I would like you to give me the morphologic diagnosis, the cause of this lesion, and for fun, name the disease. Okay, this is tissue from a horse. Can you give me an etiologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time's up. We're looking at the cusps of the aortic valve, and there are two small granulomas, each containing a single large red larval helminth. And these are granulomas caused by the aberrant migration of strongylus vulgaris. The etiologic diagnosis would be aortic strongyliasis. And if we looked elsewhere in this animal, we'd probably find in the cranial mesenteric artery or perhaps other arteries in the area, such as the renal arteries or the pudendal arteries, other larval helmets, which likely have caused a proliferative and inflammatory lesion and possible an outpouching of those arteries. Okay, we got one more. And this is tissue from a Komodo dragon, which is a very large lizard. I would like a morphologic diagnosis, an etiologic diagnosis, and a cause. Boy, this is an old picture, and the color's pretty washed out. It was taken at the A5P probably sometime in the 1950s, but a good lesion is a good lesion. And a Komodo dragon is a big lizard. And when we see diffuse fibrinohemorrhagic or necrohemorrhagic enteritis, possibly colitis, in this animal, in lizards, I want you to think about a normal inhabitant, which goes haywire when the animal's immunos, Im, immune status or diet, uh, or if they are starving, will uh, goes awry. And these normal inhabitants will invade the mucosa, ultimately getting into the portal system, causing necrosis in the liver. The etiologic diagnosis is intestinal or colonic entomibiasis, and the cause is entamoeba invadens. Entamoeba invadens are often carried by chelonians or turtles and crocodiles, which are pretty resistant hosts, but can easily be transmitted to snakes and lizards. And we say before, when something gets upset in the GI tract, normally they're very happy to live in the lumen. At this point, they invade the, uh, the wall of the gut, causing necrosis getting into the portal system, and causing necrosis in the liver as well. We see similar effects with entamoeba histolytica in primates with a similar pathogenesis and very similar lesions. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's growth path challenge and look forward for more in the future. Have a great day.